Um, okay. Welcome everyone to Therapedia and PTTV. Today we're talking about IT band syndrome, myths, and reality. And to here to um, debunk some of the myths are some of the industry's top experts. You might read their terrific and informative blogs already, but if you don't, um, if you all could just introduce yourself and let us know your background a bit. So I'm going to start. I, uh, you know, I'm going to take a stab here and say maybe I'm the youngest, maybe I'm the second. Youngest. I am the, the baldest. Um, my name is Chris Johnson. I, uh, I have a practice in New York City. Uh, I spent the first eight years of my career training at the Nicholas Institute of Sports Medicine. And uh, I'm very fortunate to join Arison and Joe Brantz uh, to discuss ITB syndrome this evening. I'm Urson Religioso. It's Urson, actually. It's like person with no P. Okay. So probably the oldest person in the group. Um, I didn't get a chance to shave my head, so um, sorry about that. Wish I could fit in with that. But um, I practice, I have a private practice in Buffalo, New York. Uh, I teach orthopedic manual therapy, and um, I teach in several fellowship programs, and I uh, blog at themanualtherapist.com. And uh, I recently started running again after taking a hiatus of about six years, mostly due to recent running research. Hi, guys. I'm Joe Brentz. I'm a physical therapist from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm also a clinical researcher, and I have a blog, forwardthinkingpt.com. Um, if you guys are familiar with me, you know that my large interest is in pain, uh, including the biopsychosocial uh, model for approaching our patients in pain. And, and hopefully with this discussion tonight, I'll, I'll bring uh, that, that model or that approach uh, into the, the care of patients with ITBN syndrome. Terrific. So I just want to go ahead, Alex. So oh, Chris is going to start us off and explain the background here. So ITB syndrome is obviously a common problem. We uh, we are in marathon season. I'm sitting here in New York, and you know we all know that the marathon was canceled. That was a smart decision. Um, but it's something that's definitely uh, it's worthy of discussion. And there are obviously a lot of ways to skin the cat and. Uh, you know, everyone seems to have different suggestions and, you know, clinical pearls when it comes to treating ITB syndrome. We know that ITB syndrome is a problem that affects the lateral aspect of the knee. Um, usually about 12% of the, the folks who complain of lower extremity pathology, um, it's stemming from iliotibial band syndrome, but there's really been a paradigm shift in, in what we view as iliotibial band syndrome. And before we delve into that, what we should talk about is what iliotibial band syndrome is not, okay? And that's LCL sprains, lateral collateral ligament sprains, popliteal tendon strains, lateral meniscal tears, hamstring strains, as well as OCD lesions, all right? So I thought what would be helpful is to get Joe to just talk a little bit about the pain that's associated with ITB syndrome because the bottom line is that no patient is ever going to seek our services if they're really not in pain affecting the lateral aspect of the knee. So that's what, land themselves, that's what lands the patient in either the orthopedic surgeon's office or in the physical therapist's office at this point with direct access. Um, so I'd like to let you just sort of chime in, Joe, and, uh, and share with us uh, some thoughts on that front. Sure, I appreciate it, Chris, and great introduction there. Um, when I was asked to, to participate in this, this talk, I was a little bit hesitant, and, and the reason why is that I don't think I've ever given the diagnosis of, of IT band syndrome to my patients. Um, patients present in my clinic with lateral knee pain, and I usually don't get more specific than that. And the reason why is that there's a lot of research that, that uh, discusses IT band syndrome as, as a possible uh, clinical uncertainty. There's no great objective test for, for IT band syndrome. Uh, we, you know, learn the OBERS when we're in physical therapy school, but there's no gold reference standard actually testing that test. Uh, it, so we're, we're kind of basing it off of our understanding of anatomy of that region. Um, now, from a pain perspective, when somebody comes to me with, with lateral knee pain, I want to know all the variables that are contributory to that, that lateral knee pain. I want to know when they hurt. I want to know why they believe they hurt. 
Uh, I want to know their, their understanding of anatomy and physiology and, and what's been told to them from a physician perspective because I believe that sometimes we need to undo some of this, this stuff that they've been told. Uh, I'll occasionally see patients that will come in with prescription that says ITBN syndrome um, and, and I'll question, how did the physician actually come to that diagnosis? Uh, it, it's obviously a diagnosis of exclusion, as, as Chris stated. There's other things that can happen in the latter aspect of the knee, um, and, and likely because this, this individual is an athlete, they, they came to that diagnosis. Now, from a pain perspective, we need to um, address uh, the patient's beliefs on why they believe they hurt. We need to address the context in which they hurt. Uh, so does their lateral aspect of their knee hurt when they're indoors or outdoors? What's the actual clinical scenario in which they hurt? Um, and then we need to educate them on, on what pain actually is so that they understand that pain is not a bad thing. It's actually a communication from the brain and nervous system to the lateral aspect of the knee. And if, if you take an individual who doesn't run, and actually I just started running myself, and, and my knee hurts, and it's likely because this isn't something that I normally do. And my brain doesn't know what's happening. And it may perceive uh, all, of the, all of these forces, all of these things that are going through the knee as potential threats. And it's responding by, by being defensive. So I think that we always got to keep that in mind. Right. Um, if I could chime in, um, obviously, you know, in, in terms of um, diagnosis, I mean, I'm, I'm heavily um, McKenzie based and I also use uh, Gray Cook's, uh, the SFMA. So, you know, when someone comes in to me, whether no matter what the script says, I think all of us as responsible PTs, we're just going to treat what the dysfunction is. And um, the only thing we can really reliably screen is movement and give the patient education uh, to decre decrease perceived threat, what Joe said. So, um, you know, my, my, uh, I, used to, I used to be a very, very avid runner and mostly 5Ks, uh, maybe 10Ks. Uh, and I was also pretty fast, uh, around a six-minute mile, but I had the biggest overstride in the world, and, and that only that only got me so far because I had to give up uh, because of knee pain, and, and uh, back when I thought that you can actually deform the IT band uh, because my lateral knee hurt, I used to just go to town on it, and it, it never made it better. Um, and, and with the advent of um, uh, Dan Lieberman uh, studying barefoot runners, and then Irene Davis, who's a PhD PT, uh, really going um, going into you know running injury um, and, and looking at the difference between uh, rear foot strikers, fore foot strikers, and mid foot strikers, and finding that 80% uh, of rear foot strikers have an injury, uh, typically of the knee and less so of the hip, and then 80% uh, of toe strikers have typically some kind of Achilles injury or calf injury, and um, Midfoot strikers having uh, very, very low percent of injury uh, other than um, heel strikers. I mean, that, that is my background on this. And um, the other things I want to contribute are uh, mainly, uh, you know, manual treatments and then patient education, what we can give to them in self-screen. So if I can just share a quick screenshot. Um, let me see if this works. Can you guys see my – okay. Can you guys see the screen? Yeah, so that's the uh, the impact gradient of a heel striker, right? Yeah. So what you have um, for for because I'm a physics nerd and uh, I do I do believe that uh, biomechanics are important in certain things and um, unimportant in other things. And you know, for my sedentary office workers, I don't uh, I don't uh, start with biomechanics so much. But for runners, I think there's there's very little in the way where we, we can ignore it because li they're literally doing the same thing over and over for thousands of steps. So the black line is, is the rear foot striker, and you can see that there is actually a distinct two strikes. So the first would be the heel strike, and that is a very, very sharp strike. So uh, there is less um, ground reaction force here. There's a bit higher when the, when the forefoot comes down, but the spike is also sharper, meaning it occurred over a less duration of time. Uh, so the, the body had less time to actually hit, uh, you know, less time to actually absorb that force. Um, for a four-foot striker, um, the ground reaction force was higher, um, and, and uh, they have to use the calf to decelerate, which is why they typically have Achilles injuries. So the ideal strike, what they found with force plates, 
was a midfoot strike or, or as close to as perfect flat foot strike as possible, where even though the ground reaction force was slightly higher or, or almost even, I don't know if there's a significant difference there, there was a, a slower ramping up, because you can even see there's a higher, a faster ramping up for the forefoot strike, uh, and, and there's a much greater um, period of time for the midfoot strike. So this is basically how I started to be able to run again. So it took about uh, maybe about three or four months for me to per really perfect a midfoot strike. So this is one of the things that if a runner recurrently comes back to me, as they often do, especially marathoners, if they want to retrain their stride, I do train them for a midfoot strike. Mm -hmm. Regardless yeah, I, of I think this is obviously a, you know, a graph that has received considerable attention. You know, I want to just really echo one of the points that Joe made. And you know, one of the tricky things, and I'm so glad we're getting the direct access. This is so critical because we have a lot of belief systems that we need to address. So when a patient comes to see me and they say, look, I've been told by my doctor who happens to be writing on Runner's World, that I have a friction situation at the lateral aspect of my knee and that there's a bursa there that's getting irritated and that I could be a candidate for a corticosteroid injection if I'm not responding to more conservative measures. That's a huge problem and it's completely based on a false premise from the research that we know. So, you know, I think that there, there are a lot of very complex situations that are going on and I think it's, it's best to leave it at there is pain in the outer aspect of my knee, all right? And to look at it, is this something that's happening when you're running on a treadmill indoors? Is this something that's happening outside? What's your experience with running? What's your reaction to this? Is this something that, you know, perhaps you think that you should push through it because maybe you, you could be perceived as weak if you don't try to push through it because people say, oh, you know, there's pain that's going to be associated with running. So I thought that was a great point, Joe, that you made about that. And I don't think we need to get in it, you know, if it's something beyond just pain in the outer aspect of me unless there's a traumatic situation, a posterior lateral corner injury or something of that nature. Um, you're so exactly, here. Yeah, you're exactly right, Chris. Uh, and, and as you stated, uh, we don't know. And, and before this talk, me and Chris were talking and, and – there was a, a researcher in 2006 and 2007 by the name of John Fairclough, and, and he looked at cadavers, and he looked at a bunch of cadavers and, and looked at the IT bands of cadavers. Uh, and he looked at, is there actually a lateral bursa there? And he found there isn't. And we thought there was, and we thought when this tendon became inflamed that we were also irritating this bursa. It's not there. This is probably why corticosteroids don't take away that pain right away. Um, this individual also found that there, there's an adherence of, of the IT band to the femur bone. And, and there's actually fat pads underneath the IT band that protect it from rubbing against the, the lateral uh, condyle of the femur. It, it's, it, it doesn't appear, at least from these cadaver studies, and this, the study has actually been replicated um, in, in 2009, it, it doesn't appear that the IT band uh, positionally could be at fault in these individuals. Um, and cadavers are, are tough to, to translate into young runners, but, but at least from an anatomical aspect, uh, it appears it actually could be something else going on in that, that lateral aspect of the knee. And, and there's some clinical uncertainty that we should have when approaching these individuals. And that right. Faircloth article really seemed to create a paradigm shift. I mean, I, I see a lot of people referencing that article, um, which I think is good. You know, I, um, but, Arison, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, um, I'm not aware of that article, but, it, but it, clinically it makes sense. But also I, I would just say that, you know, in, in terms of most of the things we see, cortisone injections don't work, and that's the reason why we see these patients anyway. Because really, they are just they are just a band aid on on whatever the problem is be whether it's central sensitization, uh, perceived threat, or uh, really poor uh, biomechanics. Um, but ir ironically, one of the things that was used uh, in Stanley Paris's curriculum, which I, uh, as you know, graduated from a long time ago, and I, I originally when I originally believed that you can deform these things, one of the studies that uh, I've lost the reference and I've even asked them for the reference and they can't seem to find it because it was a long time ago. One of the things that they originally used for, uh, for fossil deformation was that uh, they nicknamed the study Hang an Elephant, where they, where they took the fresh IT band from a cadaver, they hung a weight off of it, and they actually uh, 
biopsied it pre and, and post, and it, it didn't deform at all after you know several hours of, uh, de of potential deformation from hanging a weight off of it. And they said, well, but something must be changing. So you know maybe maybe just connective tissue or uh, you know th they kind of used it like you had to use your hands to do it because a weight wouldn't do it over several hours and they used it for passive stretching but ironically I think that was probably pretty definitive proof that you're not really going to change the structure because really if it was short it's almost like your, your hip would be abducted to the side or your tibia would be significantly externally rotated and, uh, and while I do think that uh, a loss of tibial internal rotation does does potentially cause that. You know, there's there's plenty of people with a loss of tibial internal rotation, and and they don't have knee pain as long as you you have uh, correct biomechanics. Or even and I I agree. I mean, when product. I see that when I see that structure, I say this looks like an amazing structure to tran transfer forces. So you know, if we consider it's a fact, you know, it's an extension of the glute max uh, as well as a TFL, and I'm sure there's some anatomic variability in that. You know, if the glute max is a powerful hip external rotator and it's basically converging to form part of the iliotibial tract, well, that tells me that those forces have to be transmitted distally to the tibia. And then, you know, Irene McClay Davis was involved with a, a study with Ferber et al. in JOSPT in 2010 that showed that, you know, tibial internal rotation was one of the factors that is associated, you know. And we see this a lot in recreational runners. This is not something that we see in sprinters. It's something that we see, again, in more recreational runners that are looking to start ramping up their, their distance. Um, so it's, it's just some interesting points. And there seems to be some variability in, you know, people talk about hip abductor weakness. We all know of everyone's, you know, focus on the hip right now. And I think that's something that's just going to, it's going to be, um, receiving attention, but I think there's a lot more going on than that, you know, between, you know, the whole understanding of pain, you know, the fact that we're, we're looking at things upstream and downstream relative to the site of the injury. Um, but this is not something that we typically see in more seasoned runners. I mean, I work with a lot of very experienced triathletes, and the ones who have a lot of years, you know, training and racing under their belt, very rarely do I see them come in with a complaint of, you know, the signs and symptoms that a lot of people would associate with ITB syndrome. All right, so it's it's interesting, and I think that that graph that you put up, Erson, Erson is, um, I think it it's something that really needs to be deciphered. You know, there is a study by ha Hasagawa or Hasawaga in 2009, I want to say, that looked at marathon runners, elite marathon runners at the halfway point uh, of a half marathon. And these are the cream of the crop runners and the vast majority of them were heel striking. You know, so what that tells us is that we have a group of healthy runners who are working at a very high level of performance that were heel striking. So that tells us that that's a very reasonable strategy. And the other thing that we'll see is, you know, that study also said that the fastest runners were typically forefoot striking or midfoot striking. So the tricky thing about this is that we're starting to mix and match a bunch of different groups. And, you know, I had wrote a letter to the, uh, the editor of JOSPT on this front that, you know, we don't know enough about striking yet. You know, we know that the vast majority of habitually shod runners heel strike. Um, but, you know, we have to say, look, is this a reasonable strategy for certain runners? I know that when even the elite runners break down, they'll start to adopt a heel striking strategy. The question is, what are they doing differently to offset these forces that a recreational runner isn't doing? And is it something that the tissues just have to get conditioned to? Or have they been through this experience where it's no longer perceived as a threat along the lines of what Joe has been, you know, alluding to? Right. Exactly. Um, Go ahead, Erson. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say. Um, actually, you know, I recently gave a talk to a uh, a bunch of runners that my wife just joined, like a couch to five k club, and uh, I, I gave uh, talk to a lot of them, and many of them pretty much they all pretty much have the same injury. It is knee injury, and I think that you know what, what a lot of the running research has shared with us is that uh, most of the most of the running injuries occur from uh, inadequate training or poor training or ramping it up too fast, and and again. Um, to me, 
it, it's it's all the same thing. Um, poor biomechanics lead to uh, or or ramping it up too fast lead to the brain saying, "Hey, what is going on here? Um, you know, I, I should cause some pain." Um, you know, and 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 uh, whether it's um, you know, from down to up or up to down, we still have to correct these things. There's there's definitely a lot of ways to do it. And um, one of the things I did allude to earlier is I'm not going to fix, uh, especially the more elite a runner is, I'm not going to fix their form unless they keep on coming back. And, yeah. and that, because if, if they can, um, I, I find just like you, my my triathletes and my marathoners, they don't have knee pain. They have they have. All, everything else, um, you know, but it, it's um, a lot of them have sciatica or spinal issues, but it's, it's very rarely just simple knee pain. I find simple knee pain is in the recreational runner or even the beginner beginner runner. Yeah, I, I definitely agree, Erson, and, and from my perspective, uh, I, I mean, I, I, again, I'm very biased here. I think that the, the nervous system is just perceiving that, that running is a threat to the body. Um, we have the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve that, that crosses lateral aspect of the knee. Um, I would actually say that, that that lateral knee pain is likely due to that nerve. Uh, we have a lot of tissues in the, in the body that we can blame, but we do know the one thing that nerves do um, are they, they transmit that, that output of pain from the brain to, to that portion or region of the body. Uh, so from a treatment perspective, uh, why are we trying to stretch out all these other structures when we could just kind of pull the skin on the lateral aspect of the leg and probably have somewhat of a benefit of, uh, of effect? I know that uh, Diane Jacobs is big on, on derma neuromodulation in that region. Uh, I'm big on just taping, just, just providing some type of afferent input, trying to change the brain's perception of, of what's going on in that region and hopefully having an effect on the nerve at the same time. Uh, so I, I think that we have all of these, these, these complicated theories on, on, on all the structures that could exist, but let's kind of break it down and, and, and from a pain perspective, because that's the primary complaint that, that leads them to our, our door, uh, let's address what we know. We know that pain's an output from the brain. We know that uh, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve runs in that region. Let's try to affect it from the skin and then work our way down. You know, I, it, it's interesting, you know, Erson, we haven't had a chance to talk a lot, you know, outside of this conversation about some of the, the manual approaches, but, you know, echoing some of the stuff that, that Joe just mentioned, I don't sit here and I personally don't do a ton of foam rolling or things like that. You know, what I, what I will do is get my hands on the patient, you know, and I basically am putting my, my fingers and stripping between the lateral, the, the interface between the ITB and the vastus lateralis as well as the biceps femoris in the ITB and while I'm doing that I'm talking to the patient a lot about the whole pain concept and it's sort of I'm killing two birds with one stone you know and runners are a very tricky group to talk about because you know there are so many different variables to control for and I think that if someone's looking for a research study to try and get at all this stuff good luck it's not going to happen because we haven't talked about shoe defects. We haven't talked about premature wear. I'm seeing people come in with minimalist shoes, wearing orthotics. You know, and we haven't talked about training habits, years of you know experience racing. If they've dealt with a previous injury, you know, there is so many things to, you know to address. So, you know, I think that you know along the lines of what Joe mentioned, you know, we may be better off simply tugging on the skin a little bit. But I think that. There's so much information out there that people don't have a framework to approach runners. And I think that, you know, when you go to get these folks back to running, which is really the reason they're coming to see you, they really could, you know, could care less about anything else. The question any runner has is, when can I run? You know, and that's, uh, you know, that's not something you can answer in one sentence. But I think that you know, if you systematically go through this stuff between addressing, you know, the whole concept of pain, getting them to a point where they're able to just statically balance on, on each leg, because running is hopping from, you know, one leg to the next, getting them to tolerate closed chain exercises, getting them on a progressive walking program, and then to sort of systematically go through a walk glide program where it's, you know, a warm up followed by one minute of jogging to four minutes of walking, and then two minutes of jogging to three minutes of walking, so on and so forth, and just slowly ramp them up 
you know, minimize the threat that they may perceive by just going out and trying to run 20 to 30 minutes. Let their brain wrap, you know, let their let their minds wrap themselves around what it is they're going through, and you know, for them to again perceive this to be less of a threat, I think is really important. And for them to also be in control, where they're not set on saying, "Hey, I'm going to go out and run 20 to 30 minutes," where they can say, "Look, I'm going to jog for a minute, see how things are going, you know, and then I'll walk." And I and they know that at the end of that minute, they can fall back to a walking program, and then sort of slowly get them conditioned to, you know. Greater performance, greater demands on their on their tissues. So, right, I, I agree with all those things, and you know, um, obviously, as as a manual PT, I, I'm working on the same things that, that you guys are. Um, we all have different reasons why we think they work, and um, you know, when it, whether I use my hands or a tool, I definitely um, I I use a lot less force than I used to. And I wouldn't, I, I don't even ever call it stripping anymore. I just say I'm just, I'm just going to work on this area for you because I think it's going to help you move better. So. Um, I do try to give a patient because you know different manual therapy studies will show like the temporal effects of one manual technique will last maybe five minutes. Another study will show it lasts maybe five minutes. So my big thing is, especially with my MVT background, is I have to give them a way to repeatedly load that, to repeatedly reload, and kind of recreate that feeling or that decreased perceived threat. So uh, you know whatever re the reason why, maybe it's bad movement patterns, maybe it's bad habits from the brain, maybe the brain. Uh, continuously needs uh, resetting, but I, I will try to give them whether it's a foam roll or hey, you use this rolling pin. Just try to replicate the sensation a little bit. You know, kind of, um, you know, maybe it's just uh, redefining the some cortical smudging of the area, or maybe it's uh, loosening up an area around. Uh, you know, creating a little less tone and, and uh, giving the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve a bit more room to breathe. But um, you know, I find that working on the IT band. Um, it, since we're not actually changing it, maybe we're just making it softer. For whatever reason, um, you know, I, I have to give the patient something that they could definitely always do at home because it is always on them. No matter what the condition is, I always tell them, no matter what I do, it is 90% on you because uh, nothing I do is going to last, uh, most likely. And um, so I'm also big on self screens because I, I'm, I'm big on movement efficiency. So because I find that most knees actually move very, very well, I give I give them a couple self screens and how to measure uh, hip uh, loss of hip internal rotation, loss of tibial internal rotation, loss of ankle dorsiflexion. So they can just use this as self screens, and then I give them some corrective exercises to potentially correct those things. Well, well, again, um, you know, if someone um, if someone currently comes back. That I know that something needs to be changed, other than just uh, a little bit of work to the local area, and that's when I start to go um, above and below. All right, I mean, great thoughts, Urson. I, 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 I kind of like the the little bit of clinical uncertainty and 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 things that exist. And I think one thing that we also have to understand about runners and, and what we're finding out about running is that. Uh, and actually, I, I can't say that, that I found this area. It was uh, uh, written on Todd Hargrove's blog. Uh, but the central governor theory for fatigue, and, and this very unique theory that fatigue is actually emotionally regulated within the brain, and, and versus lactic acid buildup or, or true muscular fatigue, our brain predicts when we're going to injure our tissues. So as a runner fatigues, the emotional centers with the brain activate uh, which potentially could also make it more vulnerable for sending an output of pain to that region. So if you're not listening to those fatigue centers of the brain, um, it, it's got to communicate some way. So fatigue is the first way for it to communicate. If you don't listen to it that way, it's going to make you hurt. Uh, so I think that's, that's another thing that we need to keep in mind. Right. The whole, the whole central fatigue concept is, uh, is really interesting, and I, I do want to emphasize, you know, I should preface this by saying that I've been a research subject for a lot of this stuff at the Nicholas Institute of Sports Medicine. You know, I'm, I'm a great, you know, person to do a lot of pilot work on because, you know, I am racing and I've gone through these studies and they're not pleasant. And, you know, I read the Hargrove article and, and I'm very hard pressed, Joe, and I think, you know, you and I are on the same page with a lot of stuff, but this is very much a physiologic process when when you have central fatigue so you know the study that I went through was specific to time trialing on a bicycle and what happened is they were looking at the effect of a carbohydrate beverage on performance 
at the end of a two-hour time, time trial, which is basically not the most pleasant thing in the world. And what we did is that we looked at quadriceps strength specifically. That's where a lot of the, the research is focused on. And they test your strength at the beginning of the, of the session. And say you kick out to, let's just pick a nice round number, 200 Newton meters. And then you go through this time trial, and you know there are five one-minute all-out efforts. And at the end of it, we have this magnetic stimulation coil, which has been shown to bring you up to a super maximal. It has a super maximal burst of, of uh, pulses or a train of pulses, so it'll bring you up to your max force generating ability. So at the end of this two-hour cycling bout, you may have fatigued. Say you only kick out to 140 newton meters. The electrical stim, which is delivered peripherally to the femoral nerve will bring you back up to 200 newton meters. So the muscles have the capability to generate that force. And like you said, it's very much a central process. But the question is, what's accounting for that? Is a brain basically perceiving this to be a threat and it no longer wants you to continue exercise? We do know that from this study that carbohydrate beverage will increase your ability to prolong that exercise at a specific level of intensity. So there's a lot of stuff that, you know, that we don't know yet. So I'm not going to say either of us are right or wrong. You know, that'll, that's not the point. But it is, it is interesting. What we do know is that it's the brain, you know. And how, do, how can we affect this? Is it something through caffeine? Is it a carbohydrate beverage, which we know will you know, prolong your ability to perform exercise, but it is a central process, which is a huge you know, step in the right direction to say you know, fatigue is not a function of simply lactic acid buildup, and it's a peripheral process. It's something that's central. You know? so Chris, in, yeah. Uh, to interrupt you, did, did you know it was caffeine? Excuse me? Did you know it was caffeine? With this one, so I had, no, we didn't, I wasn't a part of the study that looked at caffeine. I was a part of the study that looked at carbohydrate beverage. And I knew absolutely that at the end of this two-hour cycling bout, they put us back on the bike and had us go as hard as we could till failure. When I was drinking the carbohydrate beverage, I was able to go for 10 minutes. When I was drinking the placebo, I was able to go to 40 seconds before I crapped out. And it was Did you know amazing. which one you were drinking? Did they taste the same? Uh, they tasted pretty similar. You know, that's a question that, that's ultimately the question. You know, when they asked me which one did you think the carbohydrate beverage was, I said, that's a, that's a silly question to me. It's, it's obviously the one that prolonged my exercise. Now, was that a function of me having somewhat of a connection to the taste of Gatorade, which I've tasted a million times before? which again, my brain knows that, or is this a function of, you know, just basically good experimental design? You know, to have transparency with you guys, I told them, I said, look, I know this is Gatorade. You know, the other one could have had a similar taste, but, you know, was it just the fact that I knew that was Gatorade that pr was prolonging my exercise? I don't know, you know? So, but it, it begs a lot of questions, you know? Exactly. So, that was a simple response from you, Joe. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so. Yeah, I don't think I've ever heard you be so succinct. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so, you know, but that's one of the things that's tough, you know, when you look at all these research studies, to really get, you know, a placebo in there, you know, because anyone who's doing any significant amount of cycling knows the taste of Gatorade. They know the taste. I know the taste of Gatorade versus any other carbohydrate beverage that's out there on the market. You know, so obviously it's something familiar. I'm going to register it. My brain knows that. You know, so exactly. And there's a lot of uncertainty that that central governor theory. I mean, that, that's new. It's brand new. It, it's only been out for a year. So, and I'm sure that there were some some studies before this, but but the large proposed idea of it you know, came out over this past year. So I think that uh, there still needs to be a lot of research done. Uh, to me, it makes sense. Uh, to me, it makes sense that uh, fatigue and, and pain are probably both centrally reg regulated and probably both affect our, 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 our athletes and our runners, uh, especially the ones that aren't conditioned very well. Um, 
you know, pain is predictive and, 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 and pain is defensive, and I believe that fatigue probably works the same way, just another means of communication. So one thing I just want to chime in really quick here, I, there, there is some research out there that talks about just rinsing with a carbohydrate beverage and how that can basically trick the brain into thinking that more carbohydrate beverage is coming. So this is one of the strategies that I'll use when I'm working with athletes when they tell me that, look, I have a tough time when I'm running because of all the jostling. And I say, look, when you're in a half marathon, for example, if you're really pushing yourself, take take the Gatorade, swish it around your mouth, spit it out. And that will actually keep you going. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we have to figure out. I mean, with all these studies that emerge, there's more information coming on um, that we have to try and make sense of. And it's not, it's not quite so easy. Exactly. It's not so easy to undo what we, you know, previously believed either. And I think yeah. that that's you know, one kind of divide that, that we're facing as a profession right now, if I talk to my older colleagues and I tell them that foam roller is probably not doing anything or, or, you know, that crazy adduction that you're doing for this person's IT band, probably not completely necessary, they're going to think I'm nuts. And, 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 and I, I think that we're kind of in this divide and this shift in which we learned and, and we thought that we always needed to, to focus peripherally and we're learning that more things occur centrally or at least there's a combination of, of peripheral and central structures uh, at play in, in majority of our patient symptoms and conditions. I think we are we have a we have a huge battle on our hands though because you know what we deal with a lot is perception versus reality and I think that people's initial instinct when they get a you know lateral knee pain they're gonna jump online they're gonna end up you know, a lot of the times in the office of an orthopedist who's going to tell them it's a friction syndrome and they're going to basically wind up giving them anti-inflammatories when it's not necessary, necessarily an inflammatory process or offer them an injection into the bursa. You know, so it's, I feel like as frustrating as it is, we, you, we're, we're definitely fighting an uphill battle and I think that's why we're all on here this evening and it's comforting um, and hopefully you know, we can dispel some of the uh, the myths that patients are you viewing as, you know, reliable and accurate information. Exactly. And think about how much that sounds like it hurts, that, that you have this structure on the outside of your knee that's rubbing against the bone and creating friction. Yeah. That's like, yeah. it's like the heel spur. The heel yeah. spur sounds really negative. You think of the back of a cowboy boot that has all these sharp things. It, it's, a, it's a horrible term. And, and, and I think at least if we, I think that IT band syndrome needs a new name. Uh, obviously, a lot, a lot of individuals have dropped the friction from the, 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 the current name, but we just need to call it, you know, lateral knee pain syndrome, kind of like we did with taking lateral patellar tracking to patellofemoral pain syndrome. Or, you know, uh, we just sometimes words hurt, and, and we need to understand that as clinicians and, and understand our medical uncertainty. And when we do that, we shouldn't be creating uh, the perception or concept that an individual should hurt because of, of this friction that's occurring. Right. I think, um, you know, it's not even really only the medical profession. I would say that our own colleagues hurt. Uh, you know, I, I used to think that uh, it was easy to be a, a well-meaning, good provider, especially now that I've only, had, I've only had my own practice for two years. I think other PTs make my job even harder, you know. Absolutely. With, yeah, with with all their terminology and you know friction syndrome, and I'm thinking like, what is their knee going to catch on fire if they keep on running? I mean, the things that people say, it, it amazes. It, I get surprised every day about what what patients uh, what patients hear from other providers and even other other PTs. I mean, we often say, oh, it's just the physicians, but it's not. It's other PTs, and, and that's that's even more frustrating to me than anything. Yeah, and I, and I think that people, the public still has a perception of, hey, I'm going to go to see a physical therapist, we're going to do ultrasound, e-stim, and hut packs, and I think we're starting to get out of that, um, but, you know, it, it is tricky. I think we deal so much with the, the whole perception versus reality case, and, you know, I, I haven't been to either of your offices, you know, but I'll tell you what, when, when someone comes into my office, you know, my parents send me all this stuff from, you know, racing pictures and stuff like that. And I put all that stuff up on my wall because I want to create this perception when someone comes in and they say, oh, you know, you look like you're a healthy individual. And I say, look, I've had five surgeries. I've had 
everything under the sun. And I'll tell you what, I've been able to get through it. I've reworked my belief systems. I've been able to wrap my head around this. And you know what? My MRI, and I keep a copy of it to show my patients, shows severe chondromalacia, patella, subtle bone erosions, no medial meniscus, no lateral meniscus. And I say, but I'm running. So what does that tell us about a lot of these diagnostic findings? And I think there are cases, you know, obviously where these, these structural findings do have, you know, some meaning, but I think that we're so quick to sit there and stare at all these diagnostic tests, especially in New York City, because everyone's worried about legal implications, you know, that we have gotten so far away from connecting with our patients, you know. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, the three of us all probably do very well is we lower people's, you know, anxiety about an injury when they come in. And and I think just the way that we talk to them, the way that we, you know, interact with them, the way that we get our hands on our patients where it's relevant, you know, really is powerful, you know. And uh, I'm glad that the shift is going towards direct access because we're the folks that have the time to talk to people and are in a good position to keep up on the literature and provide our patients with, you know, with sound information. My knee hurts just thinking about your injuries. <laughs> <laughs> so. so, are we going to get any treatment at all, or, or um, just because uh, I'm fine with where we're going? That's fine. No, there's plenty of treatment on. No, I'd be curious. So, what what shoe are you? You said you're. Are you going completely unshod? Or are you? Um, are you in a, some sort of minimalist shoe? Okay, well, this is how I started running again. So I, I saw Irene Davis's um, like one-hour lecture presentation that you can kind of find on YouTube, but it's probably not supposed to be on YouTube. And then, yeah. uh, then I read her research, and uh, you know, I'm a physics guy, so that kind of made sense to me. Uh, and I really, really missed running. I probably gave up running a lot um, earlier than I wanted to, but every kid I had, because now I have three kids, I found less and less time to exercise. So um, Running's your fix. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so I, uh, I I took my normal Nike Airs, which have like the enormous heel, you know, and and that's the one thing I found interesting about her research is like basically no matter how much shoe research shoe technology has changed over the years, the the running running injury rate is is flat, like it, it's never changed, uh, despite how our shoe technology has changed, despite how expensive our shoes have gotten. So um, I, I just thought that you know maybe. Maybe I can actually change the way I run, and uh, I, I tried. I tried flat foot running, and I, I went and I observed all my kids running. You know, basically the way that uh, that all that most flat foot runners run and uh, and midfoot runners run is the way that, uh, children run. Basically, until around the age of six, when we start actually introducing heels and arch supports into their shoes, um, and then and then they kind of transition to heel strikers and overstriding. So I, I thought that if I could uh, get my foot landing underneath me, kind of straighten out, slightly lean forward, stop overstriding, I could minimize the force, um, you know, and I increase the cadence to the recommended kind of 180, which is which is very very hard. Um, but I, I can tell you that uh, you know when it took about probably three or four months, and I did the recommended kind of eccentric heel drops because um, when I when I transitioned too quickly to Nike Freeze, my my calves started really hurting. So um, I went back to my normal my normal Nikes, and I'm only running in Nike Freeze now, and I also um, run in Crocs. Mm -hmm. Joe, you're probably laughing. I mean, I what I got right off the bat from from Urson was he was ready to make a change, and he was ready to get back into running, and he was prepared to invest the time and energy, and he wrapped his head around a concept. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I can tell you, though, that I've tried to start – you know, I, I, when I try to run faster, and even if I cue my daughter to run faster, as a video I took of her running around the yard. She's running normal, uh, her normal kind of flat foot striking, landing with the foot underneath her instead of in front of her. And I tell her to go faster, and then she heel strikes. Yeah. But unnaturally, Which, go faster, 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 and she heel strikes uh, because she, she she doesn't know how to coordinate it. She doesn't know how to sequence it. So when I try to go faster and I can't in, I can't uh, do the same cadence, I overstride. And within maybe about half a minute, my knee starts hurting. Uh, I mean, I also know that I'm using my old, my old form. So, you know, does does my brain think that that form is bad for me, or is it is it bad biomechanics, or or is it both? I don't know. But either way, um, I'm just happy I can run again. 
Yeah. So I, I do think it's quite a bit easier. I think it's quite a bit easier to land with the foot underneath you and to lean slightly forward. So, you know, what's interesting about that is, you know, when people say, oh, you know, what's your striking pattern, I say, are you talking about my left foot or my right foot? You yeah. know, and the other thing I'll say is, you know, my, at this point in time, my striking pattern is a function of my intent and purpose, you know. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm accelerating, I'm on my forefoot. If I'm doing a longer recovery run, I'm using, a, you know, what I call flat-footed stride, which is interesting because coaches have been long using that term flat-footed stride, but it sort of has a negative connotation. So, you know, people have been describing it as a midfoot strike, which, you know, anatomically we can't even land on our, on our, on our midfoot, but researchers have come up with what, you know, they've defined a striking pattern as midfoot. You know, but you know, at the same time, a heel striking pattern may afford. I, you know, I tell the runners that I work with, I say, look, you know, I'm not. I want you to to avoid over striking. You know, so let's we can talk about heel striking, forefoot striking, midfoot striking. What I don't want you to do is over strike and really pound. And I think that's where the barefoot running, because I have to teach people to barefoot run, because as a triathlete. Going from the swim to the bike, you are barefoot running. So, you know, and what it is, it's a balanced, flat-footed striking pattern, which is exactly what a lot of these researchers are getting at, you know. Right, right. Um, I do so, try to say midfoot, even because flat-foot is a connotation, and flat-foot is a bad thing, and you're pronating, yeah. you're over-pronating. But even uh, you know, midfoot strikers, you are landing on slight outside of your foot, and, of course, there is a, there's, there's the normal supination. Um, but yeah, overstriking, overstriding, or overstriking, uh, overstriding is is um, you know, what we want to avoid. And uh, I I did like the research that um, uh, Greg Lehman reviewed um, a couple months ago on his blog that showed that the decreased hip extension pretty much led to overstriding, which then caused the um, you know the increased ground reaction force. So that's of course one thing, one of the things I look for in a screen too is the decreased hip extension. But of course. Potentially loosening up the IT band would increase uh, hip extension. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, both you guys, if you haven't read the uh, the Altman and Davis article, that you know, basically is current. It's a current perspective on you know the biomechanical implications of you know barefoot running, and you know they talk about some of this minimalist footwear, and you know what we know is that if you take someone bare, in you know, you put them barefoot they have greater postural stability because of the concentration of mechanoreceptors in the sole of the foot as well as the SI region, the cervical spine, but we know the second you put them in a sock they lose that and that's one of my qualms with some of this minimalist footwear, it's just so driven by manufacturers you know and again it gets back to people perceive this as sort of the way to do things you know it's like Skechers comes out with a midfoot striking shoe and people that satiates their brain and they're like I want a midfoot strike I want to get back to my roots you know if our ancestors were doing this and it's again it's it's this whole concept that people get drawn to mentally you know so it's uh, it's just fascinating you know when we work with people what in the world is going on with their mind you know versus what's going on with their understanding of their peripheral peripherally perceived injury, you know. But the colors are so cool. <laughs> exactly. I mean, they look so. like gloves. <laughs> so. but, um, about the, I, I don't want to keep you guys on here all night. It's uh, it's really a, you know, I feel fortunate to be chatting with you and uh, for Alex to have coordinated this. Do you guys have any final thoughts or anything that, uh, that you think we should leave viewers with? I think we always have to, to have somewhat of a clinical uncertainty when we approach any condition. Um, IT band syndrome is just one of those conditions that we don't have a lot of great research on uh, in terms of the etiology behind it or, or the, the preferable treatment for, for, uh, for these patients. Um, I, I think that we just need to kind of revert to Occam's razor and, and, and uh, look at when, there, when there's uh, different theories that exist which one makes the less assumptions. Um, so, so obviously we know it's there anatomically, we know what produces pain. Um, I believe that the pain in lateral aspect of the knee is probably related to lateral uh, femoral cutaneous nerve. Uh, that's what I'm going to treat because I'm 
basing it upon uh, when there's these different theories involved is the one that makes the less assumption. Um, uh, I, I, I just think that, that the syndrome likely needs a new name, and I think that it, it probably will be renamed down the road as more research is, is, is developed and, and evolves in this, in this area. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I'm just calling it, going to call it knee pain. Um, you know, I don't even name, I don't even name it aside. It's just the area for me. Uh, I do agree that I'm sure much of it is um, something I have to do with the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve because as the research is showing, and everyone's concentrating on the hip now. Um, you know, you, you can't you can't treat the knee without treating the hip, and and also I, typically I treat the ankle. And I think as physical therapists, like I said earlier, one of the other things we can screen reliably is, is movement and simple movement. So um, you know, much much of the time the knee moves well. Um, so I am gonna I am gonna typically look at how well the hip moves and how well the tibia moves and how well the the ankle moves. And uh, you know, most likely I'm gonna treat the hip and I'm gonna treat the ankle even way more before I'm gonna actually treat the knee. I, I rarely actually treat the knee itself. And, and um, in terms of explanation to my runners, um, you know, runners versus sedentary people uh, versus level of education versus what they need to hear, that's how I choose uh, what mechanism I, I, I um, you know, I kind of use in terms of, oh, it's all coming from your head or it's your mechanics. It's, it's whatever they need to hear, whatever, whatever they buy um, the most. If I feel someone needs to be educated a little bit and change, change the way they think, I will. But if they're really hard... Uh, hardcore set on you know it's all mechanics. I, I won't uh, I won't I won't delve too much. And even um, uh, Joe Nietzsche uh, agreed with me, and he said that um, only someone who's truly central sensitized should you actually use the explanation. Because otherwise, um, you know, if, if they don't believe you, they're less likely to get better. So I kind of also base that on the patient's belief system. And I you know I I concur with that. You know I think that. When someone comes in to see us, you know that it's very important we we address a concept of of pain because otherwise they wouldn't be there. And to remind the patient that you know they're functioning at a pretty darn high level if their body's able to send a warning sign for their brain to perceive this to be a threat to the point where they actually seek out you know medical attention. Hopefully they land themselves in the hands of you know medical professionals similar to ourselves. Um, I think that you know it's a complex animal, and every patient needs to be taken, uh, you know, on a case by case basis to see, you know, what it is that they're really trying to get out of our treatment, and you know, to to make sure that this is something that we minimize it being a threat to the extent that they may perceive it. Um, I I think that you know again, runners are a different animal, and to really make sure that you know we get back to David Butler saying no pain, no gain, K N O W. You know this is not something that you just keep driving through and driving through, and it's going to get better. You know it's something that you know we have to try and understand what's you know what's really the source of it or what's driving the equation. So um, I I've always been skeptical of the the diagnosis of IT band syndrome, and you know. We obviously know how easy it is to just run our mouths in, in this field. And, you know, what I always tell students that come and train with me is I say, I hate to break the news, but most of what we know is wrong. And everything always has to be, you know, prefaced with the date in medicine because what we were doing in the 1980s, saying that this is a friction syndrome and we need to stop repetitively flexing and extending the knee, you know, sounds insane at this point in time. You know, so, you know, it's something we have to continue to try to understand it. And, uh, you know, I think that we're going in the right direction. I, I think the Faircloth article is something that's definitely, you know, important for physical therapists to read. And uh, I think that, you know, for people to say ITB syndrome with pain with, you know, tenderness with palpation on the lateral aspect of the knee, a positive Obers test, which I've seen done 10 different ways, and there's no gold standard, you know, Noble's compression, these are all you know, they make me very wary of using it as a cluster of signs to arrive at a diagnosis of ITB syndrome. So, you know, I think keep it at, you know, you're having discomfort that's affecting your knee, and I'm glad you came to see me because I'm going to be in a good position to work cooperatively with you to get you back doing the things that you enjoy, you know, and, uh, and that's what it comes down to. Terrific. Well, thank you, gentlemen, so much for joining us. Uh, for those of you that are watching, you can watch this episode and more on Therapedia.com. 
and you can keep the conversation going with the hashtag PTTVITV on Twitter. And if you create a profile on the site, you can connect with these brilliant men, and uh, you can talk more about the subject. Stay tuned for more PTTV in the future. Thanks, Thank you guys. Go see you. Thanks. Bye. See you. Take care. <laughs>